During a miserable and rainy January, I found myself irrationally upbeat. Key and I were embarked on a 650 mile journey north. Even the grinding traffic of the M6 didn't dampen my spirits. Although in part, I think I was just grateful I wasn't going the other way. I'd be painting elves from the Middle Earth strategy battle game of both wood and high varieties. And I'd be starting in the third largest island in the British Isles, Skye. Gateway to the Hebrides Archipelago. Scotland's westernmost land by fact, and as a matter of it seems quite robust opinion, home to some of the UK's most outstanding landscapes. We'd be putting that theory to the test, but for the moment, I was simply excited beyond words to be back in the Scottish Highlands. Bear in mind that all of this footage was taken before it even arrived in the Hebrides. It was just Scotland's natural beauty shining through. This is why it took me about two hours longer than it should have done to actually get to Skye. I stopped constantly to gawk at these beautiful views. Parking up in the small village of Kyle of Lacalche, I got my first view of the island and the famous bridge that connects it to the mainland. I arrived on New Year's Eve, or Hogmanay to the locals. Scots pride themselves on doing New Year's Eve bigger and better than everyone else. So before it got dark, I wanted to find a town in which to park up and drink in the festivities. And before anyone thinks that I must have arrived really late in the day to get this fantastic sunset, it's like 2.45. It gets light late here and dark early. After nipping to the co-op where they really do let you know you're in Scotland, I found a place to camp out in the village of Broadford on the east coast. With a population of just 1100, that still makes it the second largest population centre on the Isle of Skye. I was therefore placing a large wager on it having something to do and a bit of atmosphere for Hogmanay. It was a wager I spectacularly lost. I therefore decided to create my own dish out of what I had with me. What I had with me happened to be the leftovers of a takeaway that fellow YouTuber JMac had bought me when I stopped off in Glasgow on the way up here. So that's three kinds of pakora, kebab meat, chips, and a big nan to wrap it in. I added beans to make it seem less unhealthy and a beer to make it seem less depressing, and I was ready to see in the new year in style. I'm not gonna lie, it was remarkably good. And after dinner, it was time to settle in and have a look at the project for this trip. I've already done a video painting one of these elves, and since the recipe is basically the same, it seems a bit futile talking about the actual painting process again. So if you've not watched it yet, start with that video which is linked below, and in this video I'm going to talk about my experience with the miniatures, army composition, and my thoughts on how they play and what I'll be doing with them later in the year. First up, Elrond, Master of Rivendell. As far as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, the first plastic kits that Rivendell have had since the game's inception 20 years ago. Maybe it's guilt over this that caused Games Workshop to bundle in a banner bearer with the Elrond dismount and mounted versions. Whatever the reason, with hype left building this long, it's fortunate that these kits live up to it. The detail is as good as we've come to expect from the Middle-earth plastic characters. That's something we can just about take for granted these days. However, both the mounted and dismounted versions both bear a good resemblance to Hugo Weaving, and that's not something we can take for granted. Here's looking at you, Three Hunters Legolas. However, there is no customization with this model, unlike some recent kits like Aoma, Treebeard, and the Eskiliath heroes from the new starter set. Also be wary that this is one of those kits where the face has to be glued onto the head, which is always a super delicate operation. The horse is standing on one leg, which makes the mounted version feel a bit flimsy, but at least it has a nice big contact point because they moulded a bunch of dirt onto the hoof. Next, I brought Haldir, the March Warden version, which means no armour. This is both because he'd be leading elves in PJs, but also because he's my favourite of the Haldir sculpts. This version with bow looks a good amount like Craig Parker, and doesn't have a sword, which in early noughties metal models always came out looking more like a bat anyway. I also brought the new resin Rumil. It's quite a downstated sculpt, but I definitely don't say that as a bad thing. He adopts a straightforward, but wholly appropriate defensive posture with sword and shield. Not every model, not even every hero, needs to have a pose like they know they're having the picture taken. Here's looking at you, Orofin. 
This actually makes Rumil one of my favourite miniatures in the range. Grounded, but with lots of character and still stands out from the Warriors. My version came out perfect, so no imperfections in the resin to fix. And the model is super easy to put together, with torso, legs and head all being a single piece, you've just got to affix the arms. Finally, I completed the set with a mounted Rivendell banner bearer to partner with Elrond's dismount. This mini is simply from the Rivendell Knights kit. After finishing construction, it was time to pack away and get ready for the New Year's Eve festivities. Now, I had previously planned to go to Edinburgh for Hogmanay, but realised it was really quite a diversion. So, I opened the van door out over Broadford Bay and I was sure that in its own way, it could compete. Probably don't need to tell you this, but New Year's Day 2023 on the Isle of Skye was cold. Normally I'd just hunker down in the van with an audiobook, porridge and coffee. However, I now cohabit with this absurd creature that insists on going out, rain or shine. It also makes quite a mess. So before I could head off further north, I had to do a quick bit of cleaning and then strap in the dog. Today I'd be driving Skye's beautiful north coast and ending within striking distance of the ferry terminal for my trip to Lewis and Harris the next day. First, I had to make a brief stop. Okay, we're only been going for about 10 minutes but we stopped with this beautiful lock below me, an amazing sunset behind the mountains in a nice quiet spot for two reasons. The first of which is because I want to spray and the second thing I need to do is to have breakfast. Um, and of course, we're going to start with the most important of the two. <laughs> I really don't know what this is, but I think my coffee might be past it. I'd be undercoating the miniatures with Grey Seer, which is a fantastic product. It goes on nice and smooth every time. However, against Ford World Resin, it's not always straightforward to figure out what parts have been sprayed and what parts haven't. After spraying, I professionally packed away with the expert Tupperware and kitchen roll technique. Safe as houses. Once the minis were packed back away and the dog was resituated, we headed off again. As was tradition by now, we'd be heading north. Excuse me, Dad. After a short while, I arrived at the Old Man of Store, an iconic rock protrusion caused by an ancient landslip that has become one of the country's most photographed landscapes. I think in part due to it being New Year's Day, there was actually a queue to get up to the Old Man of Store. It is that popular, and that is simply not why I signed up for a trip to the wilds of Scotland. Oh, okay. I've been driving for about an hour and a half. I haven't ended up where I necessarily intended to be, but this looks amazing. It's unbelievably quiet here. There's just nothing. It's just peace. I can hear the very, very distant rumble of the sea and that's it. Um, and I have a hankering to climb up that hill while it's still sunny. So we're going to do that. We're going to go for a little hike. We're going to take some miniatures. I'd be walking near the modest Loch Langeig. It lies in the Trottenish Peninsula, the northernmost part of the Isle of Skye. It was my first foray back into Scottish Highland hiking since the North Coast 500 last year and my aim was to find somewhere quiet where I could start putting the base coats down on my models. I didn't need to go far before finding a lovely spot overlooking the sea. It was, predictably, not without its distractions. Yes, yes, very good. Eventually I had the good sense to lock the ball away and it was time to start getting the base coats down in earnest. I was so hyped to at long last be starting my elves project. In whatever war game I play, I tend to gravitate towards the elven or elven equivalent faction. I identify with their knack for turning negative personal traits into positive ones. Aloof and distant? No. Enigmatic and mysterious. Self-satisfied? Condescending? No. Merely burdened by the wisdom of their years. It's a great quality to aspire to if, like me, you have crippling character defects you need covering up. Okay. I've done the green, I'm ready to move on to the next colour, uh, but I'm no meteorologist, but that 
looks bad. To me, my untrained mind, good over that way, look beautiful over that way, just stunning. Bad over that way. And, and the bad is getting closer. The beautiful is getting further and further away, as is often the case in life. And I think we need to get out of here, frankly. I did just that. Like the elves who turned their backs on the problems of the world, I decided to weather the storm in my tin box. I had another good reason to hurry, which was that at this stage I was about an hour late to my inaugural stream at a kind message from friend of the channel, Tom Marshall, who let me know that people were waiting. I therefore rushed to a site with an appropriate amount of signal and got stuck in. I then made an inauspicious start to my first ever stream by tempting the ass out of fate. Um, has the dog eaten a miniature yet? No, Callum, thankfully not. So um, I bought this tub specifically to stop her from eating the miniatures. She has tried. She tried to eat the Elrond dismount. Um, it's kind of given me a bit of a fright, but she, but she has not succeeded just yet. Um, and it seems fate was listening. Okay, so one down, one down, one is down. One of the, one of the men is down. Um, I left key alone for 30 seconds so I could move the van. 30 seconds, that was it. I was in the van. I was in because I had to just reverse and I came back and I was like, oh, oh no. There's a base on the floor with a foot on it, uh, but there's no miniature attached. So that's, that's a bad start. Um, Key was looking extremely sheepish and eventually I found Rumil's dismembered corpse. Uh, foot missing, obviously that's still on the base. Head missing, no clue where that is. Uh, and sword arm bent, that's... That's, that's it. That, that, is, that one's gone. Now it's just Elrond, Haldir, and the Vanabera. Never mind, I was in a beautiful spot, bathed in a golden sunset overlooking the sea and the Outer Hebridean island of Lewis and Harris. That would be my destination for tomorrow after an evening's painting and my traditional wild camping dinner of spinach and ricotta tortellini. After dinner and the careful management of a highly food motivated dog, it was time to get down to painting. As always, and by necessity, starting with my least favourite bits, getting all those bold base colours down. Slapping down the brown fur and the grey hair, I was realising that this is a beautiful, dynamic and sturdy sculpt. It's an almost maudlin reminder of what could be if only those 20 year old warrior horse sculpts, like a new rider to Rohan, were brought into the 21st century. I then did some washes as sort of a treat, kind of like dessert, and then it was time to head to bed. So this is how incredible the island of Skye is. Key and I are out on our walk. I have no filming equipment with me at all because I didn't intend to be filming here. And yet stumbling down the beach, we found, he, he's standing in one, she's standing in a dinosaur footprint. There's another one there. These are actual dinosaur footprints and I'm so unprepared, I'm filming it in selfie mode on my phone. In fact, the only thing I have with me is a there wasn't even a sign. There's not even a sign saying, hey guys, 170 million year old dinosaur footprints this way. There was just nothing, which I think is, you know, that, it, that speaks to the magic of the island. It must do, because it has so much to see. They don't even bother pointing them out anymore. That's how good it is. Having wet my whistle on a slice of Sky's magic, I set my sights on the next destination just across the water, the one island with two names, Lewis and Harris. Good girl. Oh. Good. Very good. I would be back in Sky. I certainly wasn't done with it yet, but there was a reason I wanted to reach Lewis and Harris to paint my elves. Broadly, the theme for my army was going to be the combined force of Lothlorien and Rivendell that Elrond led against Angmar. This is why I was using the cold colours like turquoise, white and blue shading. I would show you pictures of artists' conceptualizations of Angmar, but I don't have anyone's permission. But why not pause the video and go Google it? What's going on here, dude? Although, please do come back. God, Jesus, come back. 
I'm not sure my YouTube KPIs can take it if all my remaining viewers dip out now and then just forget about it. What do we do now? Anyway, uh, if you did or do go Google, you won't see trees or plains. You'll see foreboding icy landscapes. You'll see labyrinthine rocky tundras, mountains, and snow. It is the inspiration for this setting that I hope to find in Lewis and Harris. Okay, I think we're heading in, dude. So Key and I clambered aboard, ready to sail into the west. We were directed to the pet section of the ferry and took our seat. I was childishly excited to be on a big boat, but I must admit, even more excited for a proper meal. But with that done, we had to be back to the grind. It was time to continue the base colours on the miniatures and I started with Russ Grey on the chainmail. Elrond was an easy pick for me in this force. The theme demanded it because he was there. It is a delightful new plastic sculpt and I was all too happy to jump on the bandwagon. And let's face it, he is just an icon. I am just all too happy to walk around saying things like, our list of allies grows thin. Annoyingly, I hadn't packed a wet palette in order to start on the gold. But it didn't matter. In a moment, someone burst into the cabin and explained that they'd seen dolphins off the bow of the ship. Key and I raced upstairs to try and spot them. Did you see it? Again, zoomed in and in slow motion. There it is. I promise you, that's a dolphin. Or a very big tuna. Whatever it was, it brings me on to my next and final reason for visiting Lewis and Harris. Wildlife. Generally, it plays a big role in the magic of Tolkien's Middle Earth, and particularly so with the elves. Now, obviously, I had the dog with me, but I did have some rather more exotic targets on my wish list. Those being seals, otters, dolphins, which I'm counting as done, deer, and golden eagles. I wanted to see all of these before I returned to the Scottish mainland. So, as we docked in Port Tarbet and Key and I returned to the van, I knew I had my work cut out for me. Good. In. Up. Up. Good. Good girl. Today I'd be heading south to find somewhere to camp, near the famous Luskan Tyre. Normally an area known for its golden sand beaches and turquoise waters, I was there for rock and snow. Now it was only about a 15 minute drive and I'm going to play the time lapse in full to show you why I was feeling so optimistic that I'd hit the jackpot for my themey inspiration. There was barely a tree in sight and clearly the road had been carved through this otherwise unnavigable field of rocks and crevasses. Every surface was touched by fresh snow and it seemed that in any direction you looked there were distant foreboding peaks. The waters were a light cool blue and even though it was early afternoon the sun was setting. It made the light feel remote and distant, it cast long shadows and put touches of red into the clear skies. I pitched up at a spot by a saltwater lagoon. Key and I stepped out the van onto Lewis and Harris for the first time and breathed in what I think might be the most beautifully clean air I have ever tasted. I feel like I have to be clear, the water here is not frozen, it is just glass smooth. The air was imperceptibly still. This only added to the atmosphere of otherworldliness, only slightly ruined by that Ford Focus honking at me as it drove past. After gawping at the view for a while, it was time to try and wear out the dog so that I could actually get some honest to god painting done this evening. After spending the day in the van and on a boat, this took a remarkably long time. I've eaten and Key is calm and I've learned that when Key is calm, I need to be painting if I'm going to get anything done. Um, I have rectified my error on the ferry with my homemade wet palette and I'm ready to go. I also have my mum's Christmas cake uh, and it's excellent. It's exceptional. So that'll sustain me. By now we'd lost the tranquil stillness of earlier and the wind was really picking up. Fortunately, with the dog down and walked out, I didn't actually have to go anywhere and I could finally just settle in and get painting. I'm starting by basing up the gold parts. When I filmed this six months ago, I hated doing the gold. Hated it. It scared me. I'm actually now really enjoying it and I'm slowly getting better. But I guess that's because in the six months after this video, I've You're painted so an entire sorry. army of Glathrim in not metallic metal gold. I think if I could reach back in time and give myself a hint, it would be not to overthink, not to overcomplicate 
You don't need to worry about every single blend and every single transition. I found that as long as I thin my paints appropriately, I've got plenty of time to go back and correct transitions and fix mistakes after I've basically roughly sketched out where the highlights and lowlights will be. I am a very long way from being an expert, but I'm starting to enjoy it and I'm starting to understand a bit more about what I'm doing and how to make it look good. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you a bit about the lore of this Athemi army of Elves v. Angmar, but um, I obviously don't know anything about the lore. I'm useless. So I have once again drafted in uh, J Mac from J Mac's Armies of Middle Earth to bail me out, basically. When the Witch King first founded Angmar in the north in the year 1300 of the Third Age, King Argaleb of Arthedain claims kingship to all of Arnor. King Argaleb then fortifies the weathered hills between Arthedain and Rudar however, is killed in battle in 1356. The Witch King then decides he is going to attack Rivendell. After a siege of around 40 years, Elrond is finally able to break it with help from the elves of Lothlorien, Cairdan from Linden, and the men from Arnor. The Witch King being thwarted then regroups and invades Arnor again, but this time he sneaks round and attacks from the south, bypassing the fortified weathered hills. This is when the Tower of Amon Sul is destroyed, the Witch King presses his advantage and sieges the capital of Fornost. However, Cirdan from Linden comes to his aid and the siege is broken. The elves then release their full strength on the Witch King. A huge alliance of Rivendell, Linden, Lothlorien and Arnor march upon Angmar to deal such a blow that the kingdom is abandoned for centuries. Unfortunately, Arnor was also left in a very weak state following this and by 1601 a majority of the lands were abandoned. This is when the Shire gets gifted to the Hobbits. Sadly, as Arnor is just regaining some of its strength, a great plague comes out of the east and devastates Cardolan, and the last of the Dúnedain there perish. The Witch King would send evil spirits down to this area where the Dúnedain perished to reanimate the corpses. This would become the area known as the Barrow Downs. Then centuries later, in 1973 of the Third Age, the Witch King amasses a huge army and unleashes it on Arnor. Things were looking lost. However, a prince from Gondor arrives in London with an army so large that the ships fill all the ports of the elves. Cirdan, with the prince of Gondor and the remnants of the Arnorians, then sweep the Witch King's army off the field and press on to Angmar. The Witch King tries to retreat to Cardum, his fortress in Angmar, but is set upon again by the Alliance, who are now also joined by Glorfindel and a massive force from Rivendell. The Witch King's army is utterly destroyed and he flees the plain of the battle. The Prince of Gondor wishes to chase him, however Glorfindel stops him. And this is where it's prophesied that no man will slay the Witch King. So there you go. The theme of my army is, um, well, it's what he said. If you want to see another of his cool lore videos, then click the link in the description. Although I did ask him to keep it to less than a minute, so I kind of feel like he exceeded his brief. You know, I have to say, it's strange, isn't it? I've had such a good day today, despite the fact it technically hasn't hasn't really been anything holiday-ish. It's just been logistics, you know, getting from A to B on the ferry. But it just felt very, I don't know, good in a intangible, indefinable kind of way. You know, I started the day with kind of low mood, but for no discernible reason. And I've ended it with quite a high mood for no discernible reason. And in the middle was a boat that goes quite slowly. Mysteries of life, eh? With that extremely profound observation out of the way, I continued on to Haldir. Now I can't hand on heart make any case as to why Haldir fits into the theme of my army. I took him because he's new for me. I've never had a shooting focused hero before in MESBG and I wanted to mess around with his sneaky shenanigans, his elven cloak, his expert shot and his heroic accuracy. Despite this, I've still not actually used him six months down the line. Instead, his place was taken by Gildor Inglorion from the Rivendell list. You can see how that went in the 2023 Scouring of Cheshire videos. I still want to take Aldir, but I must admit I've now brought the Armoured Bow version, and I expect he might be usurping the PGA Bow version in the future games. She's awake again. Awake or not, the dog didn't stop me from cracking on with my standard bearer on foot, one of my favourite models to come out of Games Workshop in recent years. They are noble, stoic and regal, exactly what you'd expect from an elf trusted to hold the standard of the house. However, despite what on the face of it appears to be quite a basic posture, there is so much detail to it. I love the fact you can see the shape of the sword beneath the cloak. 
I love the patterns in the helmet and the armor and the way that the model goes together hiding almost all of the joins. I don't like the fact that on the front of the model there is leather ornaments over the armor plating. It's very difficult to pick out. Anyway, I finished by basing the blade of the spear with administratum gray. Oh. <sighs> We've just come back from a dog walk and uh, you know, I was thinking, first, I'm not too big to admit that being in places like this sometimes can make me feel quite vulnerable. Um, remote locations where it's dark, properly dark. The only lights you have are the lamp you bring with you and, um, well, the light of the moon. And it's also really quiet. Like, there is no evidence of humanity in the sound. You get the lapping of the sea on the beach and you get your own footfalls, which ricochet off the labyrinth of rocks that abut you on both sides. And it can make you feel fearful, both of the rational, because I'm like, well, what if I became ill out here or something happened to me? And the irrational, i.e. what if there's someone who wants to kill me and they're standing right behind me. And I think that that's happening every single time I see a flicker of my lamp across uh, an unusually shaped rock or I see, I hear a footfall as it echoes in from behind me and it sounds like there's someone walking just behind me. Um, and you know, you, you, can, you can quite easily get in your head about it and start to get a bit riled up. But now I realise that when that hits its crescendo and I start to think like, actually I want to get back to the safety of the van, Key comes bounding into view with her flashing LED collar that lights up her flapping ears that kind of bound up and down as she gambles on into my field of vision. And it's like, oh right, everything is completely fine because nothing bad can happen when there's a Labrador around. <coughs> this cutesy newfound faith in the power of my Labrador lasted all of around two hours until the weather started to get considerably more extreme. Okay, I'll admit to being slightly concerned. We appear to be stuck in the middle of this storm for hours now. And the rain is so heavy. And the wind is so strong, it's rocking the van. Gosh. I'm not looking forward to taking the dog for a walk. Also, I hope we don't get swept away. We didn't. Despite the absolute racket that storm made, both Key and I were still there come morning. What hadn't survived, however, was all of my perfect, beautiful, idyllic snow. The entire covering, the entire island, simply swept away. What was left was mud, and an increasingly slim prospect of me maintaining a habitable living environment in the van for the next week. Still, the sun did come out, and I was determined to make an absolute day of it. After, of course, making a brief stop to fill up my water bottle. My first objective for the day was to find seals, and in chatting with someone on the ferry I was told that my best chance was by exploring the Golden Road. This is a stretch of road on the northeast coast of Harris. It supposedly gets its name from its construction cost, although that is heavily disputed. I wasn't too fussed about that. What mattered to me was, allegedly, you can see seals bathing on the rocks from the road. I mean, I will throw my theory into the ring and say, perhaps it gets its name from the dangerously fierce glare from the sun as you approach the road from the west. This limited visibility happened to combine with an incredibly windy stretch of road, often with hills on one or both sides. Anyone who saw last year's North Coast 500 trip will no doubt recognize this style of road from that which stretches through a scent, which turned out to be one of the best days driving I have ever had in my life. Unlike a scent, this one does not take the whole day to complete. Soon enough I was at the sea and more than halfway through the route, I was keeping my eyes peeled for the telltale sign of seals. Okay, I've stopped because I'm about two thirds of the way round the Golden Road now and it does occur to me that I don't know what I'm doing. I, I don't even know where to start looking for seals. There's a little rocky beach down there. 
it's the best I've got so far. So we headed down to the beach. This was realistically my last chance on the golden road to actually find any seals. And I was really hoping I could check this one off the list. Yeah, this is clearly all closed. I'd never actually seen seals before in my life, and ever since I was a child, they've been one of my favorite animals. I think it's because they're so relatable. Okay, Stiggy, I'm gonna go scout. This made it all the more tragic that I returned empty-handed. That was a big neddy no on the seals, I'm afraid, dude. There were some big rocks that looked a bit like seals. I didn't think I was gonna cut it, though. Well, that's the golden road done, and I have emphatically failed. I think the plan might now be to scrap seals for the day, because I've got an excellent juicy hint on where to find some otters. For this, I'd need to head back past Port Tarbet and to a separate tiny island called Scalpe. I quickly saw a sign that I would have more luck with the otter hunt. I mean, come on, an otter's crossing warning sign might be the most magical road sign I have ever seen. I was heading for the Eileen Glass Lighthouse on Scalpe. We'll get into why and what it's about, but first I had to find a car park I was told to expect at the start of the walk to the lighthouse. I saw a little lay-by for a couple of cars to park in and assumed that wasn't it, and so carried on up the road. That involved making an extremely tight turn up an extremely steep hill. After that, the road gave way entirely to this gravel track. And of course, it was at this point that I started to realize I might have made a mistake. It's hard to describe quite how steep this incline is. I'm not so convinced I was meant to have driven this far. I think turning round sounds like a plan. After about half a mile, I found a spot to do just that and headed back down the track, hoping my van would actually make it all the way. Ugh. I'll be happy to be back to normal roads, I tell you. I did make it back and realised, of course, that the lay-by was the car park all along. I packed up, grabbed the dog and prepared for what I understood to be about an hour's walk back up the path to the Eileen Glass Lighthouse. If you ever find yourself here, this is a lovely little walk and it is well worthwhile. It only takes about 40 minutes each way and during that time you'll get some breathtaking views over some of the most isolated parts of this little island. You can't get lost because the hills quickly fall away and the lighthouse will loom into view. You quickly get a sense of just how isolated a person must have felt to have worked here. The uh, complex was first built in the 1700s, the first of its kind in the Hebrides archipelago. To be honest, the tower was then replaced in the 1800s, and to me, that's the main sort of lighthouse bit. In the 1970s, it was a guinea pig for lighthouse automation, and uh, it's continued to make history right up into this millennium. In 2004, the owners were convicted of running a fraudulent charity in an attempt to pay off the mortgage on the lighthouse. That's sadly the only bit of financial criminal history I could find to crowbar into this video. So, I have to say, now that we're here... Oh, good girl. Ow! That's not helping. That's not helping. Fuck! Oh! 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 I'm worse than you now, dude. Thanks for the assist. Can you budge up? Anyway, what I was trying to say was that according to the man I met on the ferry, this is a fantastic place to see otters. He said there are four or five that sort of come up out of the water onto the bridge below, and, uh, and this is basically where they live, and so this is what I should try. Um, now that I'm here and I see the scale of the place, I do wonder whether either A, he was exaggerating, or B, he was having me on. And if he was the latter and he was having me on, then I can see that, you know, I can see the humour in that, I can laugh at myself. <laughs> There's some English dweeb. Let's send him to the furthest possible part of the island, uh, the most remote location we can think of in search of mythical otters. That'll be, that'll be good. That'll be funny. It is, it is funny. It's also really not f***ing funny. Um, so if you're watching Ferryman, you win. Congrats. We'll go down, we'll see if we can find something. If not, on your head be it. Um, but it, if, if not, at least it is one of the coolest places 
I'll ever have painted. Just a quick update to say this is where the otters are meant to be. Uh, I will say that it is staggeringly beautiful. I will also see that it is officially an otter-free zone. Not an otter in sight. The lighthouse is open to the public, but it is not monitored. I arrived to find it completely deserted. Whilst many of the buildings are now deserted, such as the accommodation and the old giant foghorn, the tower itself is still operational. Visitors cannot access the buildings themselves, at least not when I was there, but you can walk around the entire site completely unhindered. The views out over the sea and also the historical complex itself make this a trip well worth making. Whilst lighthouses, including this one, still function, there is no doubting the history in the place. Oh, absolutely incredible. And I'm finally getting a glimpse of the famous turquoise Hebridean waters. They brag endlessly about the turquoise beaches, uh, evidence of which I'm yet to see until now. This is magnificent. Clearly, I was too distracted to take a clip for you of the beautiful Hebridean waters, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. The last thing I checked out was the colossal old foghorn. Installed in 1908, it operated for 80 years. And with the tour coming to a close, it was time to get down to the real meat of the business, the reason I was here. I genuinely don't think I can think of a better place to set up and do a little bit of painting than here in this historic monument, backed by some of the most spectacular terrain uh, that Scotland has to offer. Key has other ideas. Leave it, Key. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Good. Sit down, please. Sit down. Good girl. Whilst here, I started building up the turquoise on the cloaks. Just like with the gold, I've learned a lot since this trip by doing a lot of cloaks. So whilst you can see what process I'm following here in the video linked below, I'll talk a little bit about what I've learned and how I think I've improved the recipe going forward. What I wanted was cloaks that pop and that had a little bit of magic about them by going from a neutral dark green to a very vivid bright blue. The mistake I made was focusing too heavy on the dark greens and the low lights and not quickly enough building up to the lighter colors. In an attempt to make the transition smooth, they ended up being too subtle. Later, I would go over these cloaks bringing in brighter colors much earlier, and that made them really stand out. It also meant I could have bright, vivid highlights without them looking too stark against the darker colors in the cloaks. This is a lesson I've translated over to other projects too, where I want the colors to be poppy and bright. It's made me think about where the focus should be in my color recipes and stopped me from being too timid about using bright colors, which I used to think would look garish or tacky. Anyway, lesson learned, before long, the sun was going down and it was time for us to start packing away and making our slow meandering way back to the van. Of course, thing, the one thing I'd not succeeded in was finding any otters. That was until I found someone jogging the path on the way back to the van. They told me that the best place to find them wasn't at the lighthouse, but under the bridge I'd crossed to get onto Scalpe Island in the first place. It didn't sound as idyllic, but after an animal free day, I was willing to try anything. It was uh, quite a sketchy drive to get down besides the bridge and what was perhaps even more concerning was that there clearly once was a gate that stopped people from accessing this area but that has at some point been rammed down. But I was not going to abandon an opportunity to see sea otters. I got right down by the waterside and I paced back and forth looking for any sign. But it just seemed like Lewis and Harris wasn't the amazing magical wildlife haven that the tourist board had made it out to be. Or was it? That's an otter. That's an otter. This is what joy feels like. This is what joy feels like. That's a fucking otter. I don't, I, my, my main camera ran out of power, so I'm just on my mobile in selfie mode, tethered to a power pack. That's the kind of professional wildlife photographer I am. But shit, photography or not, that was an otter. That was an otter. I found one. Before long, it was back and I raced to get my proper camera working to get some marginally improved shots. This is a European otter. They spend most of their time in seawater to hunt, but they will range into fresh water in order to clean the salt out of their coats. After it finally drifted on out of sight, I spent another hour waiting in place for another to come along or maybe to catch a glimpse of a seal or an orca or something, I don't know. <sighs> oh. Now I've got to get back up that hill, dude. Hey? I didn't see anything else, but frankly, I'm counting that as a big win. 
Seeing an otter in the wild, absolute bucket list item. Come on. Fuck. Just a little for a glimpse of an otter. With the van struggling and my belly rumbling, I went out in search of fuel and food. It was then time to head out and find somewhere to camp for the night, and on the way, something caught my eye. Stay. About 100 feet back, there was deer on the road. I pulled over, turned around. And they're in the field ahead of me. Listen. I don't think I can catch them at sufficient range on this camera. But I can see them just about. It's about five and I don't really want to get any closer. But I'm camping so close to here tonight. I'm going to come back tomorrow morning and I hope that we can find them. So for my safety and so that I didn't accidentally disturb the deer, I got back in and I left. But it wasn't long before... There, on the side of the road, on the left. See them? I can't stop. Ah, oh, it's so annoying, I can't stop. There was three deer. I will, I'm sure I'll be able to spot them. There, there's another one left of the carriageway there I could see him on the camera so uh, I can at least prove they were here there's another one on the right hand side another one on the left ah oh, they're everywhere they're everywhere there's a stopping point they're everywhere but I just can't I can't pick them up on either this camera or there's every one um, so like I say we're moments moments from the final stop we're going to get there paint in camp tonight and then come back this way. It looks beautiful anyway, so it'll be a great little walk. I found a nice quiet place to stop by the side of the road. I understood it to be overlooking a huge valley with a lock at the bottom, which will be lovely once I get the sunlight for it. I was very excited to spot the deer, but for the moment I'd have to put that out my mind and get on with an evening's painting. As you can see, I'm still working on the cloaks. I'm sorry, we're basically just in the midst of cloak fest at the moment. I think the pace at which I'm tackling them is both a symptom of my lack of confidence with the color recipe and also the expense of the individual sculpts I'm working on. However, it's an opportunity to show you what I mean about the changing techniques. You can see on screen now how dark the cloaks are, despite the fact I'm basically up to edge highlighting already. We can compare that with a couple of shots I took at a recent tournament where I had the cloaks finished up in my new style. And actually I'm glad that I gave myself permission to go back and change things. Sometimes it can be really hard once you've committed to a particular scheme to reflect and think about whether or not you might want to change it going forward. All right, to be honest, at this stage, I have no idea whether I'm ahead or behind or whether I'm doing good work or bad work. I have just a brain full of bobbing otters and flashing deer and I don't really have space for anything else. I don't know what's going on with the miniatures. I'm ready to just brush my teeth and head to bed. I would be back to find the deer. I would be back to find the eagles and I'll be back to Sky to undertake one of the most superb hikes I've ever been recommended. If that's of interest, I hope you'll come back for part two. I have to say thank you so much again to my patrons who have literally kept me on the road after some van related mishaps over recent weeks. Every one of my miniatures I take to an event, they're all assigned to one of my patrons so we can decide who is lucky and who is unlucky. Feel free to check out the Patreon page in the link if you're the kind of person who really enjoys having less money than you theoretically could have. Otherwise join the Facebook group, which has actually been a lot of fun in recent weeks. I know, fun, Facebook, it's strange. Otherwise I'll say only, thank you so much again for watching. <laughs>